Welcome to this episode of ClearedCast, your source for security clearance, intelligence community, espionage, national security, and defense contracting updates, and our exclusive interviews with intelligence community and government leaders. Thank you for tuning in to this more horrific episode of Cleared Cast. I am your host, Katie Keller, and today I'm joined by Sean Bigley, who is a security clearance attorney who represents clients worldwide in security clearance denials. He assists service members, federal employees, and contractors in all stages of the security clearance process for upcoming investigations or representation at formal hearings. And he's also a former investigator at OPM and is a clearance jobs news site contributor. So Sean Sean, thanks so much for joining me for this more scarier version of ClearCast. Well, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Today, we are going to be discussing security clearance horror stories. Uh, There are a few that are sort of no-brainers when it comes to avoiding them, but there are also others that may be not so much common sense. But I thought that we could start off on a horror story that was actually shared by an investigator on the Clearance Jobs blog who was conducting an interview in the field. Here is a quote from that commenter. So I was interviewing a neighbor and his gaggle of children were running and screaming and dancing around us. I was concentrating on the interview, yelling my questions over everything. Out of the corner of my eye, I see one of the little guys running at me. And before I know what's going on, the kid screams candy and shoves something into my mouth. I spit it out on the floor and glared at the person trying who was trying to obtain the security clearance who was mortified and speechless. So just a funny sort of horrific. <laughs> story around Halloween. Before we get into a few of your clearance horror stories, uh, what made you interested in the security clearance process or how did you get into the field? Well, I actually had a background in law enforcement uh, when I was younger and uh, that sort of piqued my interest in investigations. Um, I also worked in the Bush administration and so I had been through the security clearance process myself and Ultimately, uh, when I decided to go to law school, I put myself through law school as an investigator. Being on that side of the table, it became pretty quickly apparent to me that there was a need for attorneys specializing in this field. After law school, decided to put out a shingle and here I am. Well, you have a very well-rounded perspective about the process, but as an attorney, obviously keeping folks' identities confidential, do you have any top clearance horror stories that come to mind that you could share with us today? Sure. Well, I will tell you first off that I think that what constitutes a horror story is largely dependent on where you're sitting uh, in the process, your perspective, if you will. Having been on all sides of this as, as someone who was being investigated for clearance and someone who was doing the investigations and now someone who's defending applicants, I really think that I've seen it all. And I, I think for applicants, something that would certainly constitute a horror story would be clearance background investigation and adjudication that takes four or five years to complete Believe it or not, that is something that we see on a fairly regular basis with some of the intelligence community agencies that does include the time for appealing an initial denial. But nonetheless, for those folks who are trying to uh, be patriotic and serve the country, it's really unfortunate that some of the cases seem to fall into an abyss and, and take that long. As an investigator, I had plenty of horror stories, everything from being attacked by wild chickens to being cursed at to being threatened. It was all sort of part of the job. And I'm sure everybody who's done that job has plenty of their own stories. Now, you know, being an attorney defending folks who are being denied a clearance, some of them uh, unjustly, we see a lot of cases where the human factor or the human element sort of comes into the equation. And you just can't predict what people are going to say or do when they get on a witness stand and they're in the hot seat in front of an administrative judge. Uh, we've had cases where folks have been uh, accused by the government of presenting a security risk for uh, alcohol history, for example, and they've shown up uh, after swearing up and down that they have no longer uh, an alcohol problem and they've quit drinking. Uh, they show up to their hearing reeking of alcohol. We've had other cases where you know, witnesses show up and they're there to sing the praises of the person that they are testifying as a character witness for. And in the midst of their testimony, they blurt out uh, something to the effect of, I'm so glad John Smith has kicked his drug habit and the case had nothing to do with drugs. So there's all sorts of things that we see on a day-to-day basis that I think uh, you know would make a lot of folks cringe. It's sort of that skeleton in the closet situation. At the same time, we deal with a lot of very, very good people folks who've just had a lapse of judgment or they've made a mistake. 
or things that you know really are no fault of their own. They have relatives overseas or they had a real rough year with some health conditions and they fell into some debt. Those are the, the cases that we really uh, take pride in defending uh, because at the end of the day, a clearance is really a meal ticket for a lot of people. And I think that outside the Washington, D.C. Beltway, folks don't always understand what a security clearance means. And in fact, for many, many people, millions of people, it is the equivalent of a professional license. You need it to do your job. And without it, for certain specialties and, and fields of expertise, job opportunities can be difficult to come by. That actually reminds me of a clearance horror story where this person happened to be uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time at work and a group of co-workers did something that basically ha- had a loss of jurisdiction placed on you know, their J-Pass records. And so I-, I think that's another big you know, horror story is when that happens, whether you're involved or not, that just happening, uh, again, puts your job at risk. It does. And, you know, the the problem uh, with these loss of jurisdiction cases is a very technical one. It's something that is, for most people, very unglamorous and not the type of thing that, you know, is going to get attention from policymakers. But at the end of the day, the reality is that There are a lot of people, I would venture a guess, probably thousands of people a year who fall into this problem and this situation where they are essentially accused of having done something most often in the workplace, uh, some sort of misconduct. They are terminated from their position without any due process. And as soon as that termination happens, they are really left without recourse. They are uh, in a situation where the government will not adjudicate the allegations against them until and unless they find a new cleared employer who's willing to sponsor their clearance. Unfortunately, that often is difficult to do. It, these these JPAS incident reports can often be a scarlet letter. And so we've been fighting this issue for a number of years, trying to get some more transparency, some more due process in the system. But unfortunately, it's going to take some action at a very high level within the Defense Department before that happens. Sure. So one of the clearance horror stories for folks is actually a part of the process of filling out an SF-86. It's a lot of questions. It's a big document. And you recently wrote an article about the financial history section of that form. And you've seen applicants check yes, and then document a history of noncompliance with their tax filings that may result in their security clearance being revoked. Could you briefly touch on that article that folks can find at news.clearancejobs.com? I'll start off by saying, you know, first of all, as as we often talk about on clearance jobs, uh, financial issues are the number one reason why people are denied a clearance. And for a lot of people who are first applying, that is not an obvious thing. Uh, Most people who are first applying for a clearance in our experience are looking at issues with substance abuse or foreign contacts or things like that that are sort of the more intuitive reasons for a security clearance denial. And meanwhile, they're missing the glaring lights and and signs, you know, that are out there as far as their financial history. And so one of the frequent issues that we've encountered is a lack of understanding as to what constitutes late filed tax returns. And again, this may sound like a really obvious thing at first blush. We deal with a lot of folks who are serving the United States overseas, and they're serving with honor and distinction um, in a war zone. And uh, as a result of that, they have a little bit of delay in getting their taxes filed. They don't always realize that the government is understanding and they're aware of the, the problems that sometimes come up when you're serving in a war zone. And so they've specifically built in to the law a provision that says if you are serving in a dedicated combat zone, you have an extension automatically. You don't have to do anything automatic extension to file your taxes until six months after you return from that combat zone. Now, what constitutes a combat zone is actually a pretty broad spectrum of places. And you can go online and look that up on the IRS website. There's a whole list of countries that qualify, and some of them are not obvious. Some of them are combat support zones. But nonetheless, you know, we see a lot of folks shoot themselves in the foot by answering questions on the SF-86 incorrectly, either in the financial section or elsewhere, And those problems are often avoidable with legal advice up front. A little bit of time and effort can often save folks a world of headaches on the back end. One thing that you've mentioned in multiple articles is the fact that, you know, sometimes we are, we're, we're our own worst enemy and, you know, seeking out that legal advice. And before you submit any type of form, it can be helpful in sort of mitigating some of these issues. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, I I think really a lot of the horror stories, quote unquote, uh, that we see 
in this process are people who just didn't take that time and effort up front to sort of dot their I's and cross their T's, whether or not they have the assistance of an attorney, but really just, you know, making sure that what you're submitting to the government is not only accurate and truthful, but also complete and done in a way that puts yourself in the best possible light. And there are ways to do that, even within the SF-86 form. To avoid experiencing some of these horror stories, folks can do things like be truthful, don't hide things, avoid certain crowds that may have illegal tendencies. So what other advice would you offer folks just so they don't enter some of these scarier predicaments? Well, I think, you know, before anybody applies for a security clearance, I would suggest sort of making a careful assessment of their own background to determine, um, you know, whether or not there are issues that could preclude the clearance from being granted if there are. And, and you know, some of those things are obvious. Again, some of them may not be, but you can find the SF-86 form online. You can find it very easily through Google and you can scroll through it and see what are the categories of, of things that are being covered and sort of get a sense of whether or not you may have some some hiccups or some problems uh, based on your own background. And if you do, there's options. You can, as I said earlier, consult with legal counsel. You can wait and buy yourself some time. Very often we have to advise people that time is their friend and certain things that they may have done in their past or that may have happened to them in the past, if they can just be patient and you know wait for a few years, those things can be mitigated with the passage of time as long as there's not recurrent similar behaviors. For example, you know, if you have very recently done uh, any sort of illegal drugs, that is probably going to be a holdup for you getting the security clearance. But if your last use was a year or two ago, maybe not so much. So, you know, those are things, uh, you know, I think, you know, sort of an honest, candid reflection uh, as to whether or not you would be eligible for a security clearance for a first time applicant is very helpful. And then for folks who are reapplying for a clearance, Understanding what the government is looking for and particularly what issues are self-reportable during the time that you hold a security clearance is very important. We see a lot of cases where folks have something happen between periodic reinvestigations and they sort of cringe and go, oh, you know, I'm I get better brace for some security problems. But fortunately for me, I don't have to deal with that for another five years they wait, they sit on it, they don't tell anybody. And then the five years goes by and the government says, why is this the first time we're hearing about this? You were supposed to report it. And it, it sort of mushrooms and it becomes a bigger problem than maybe it needed to be. Just understanding what the policies are that are applicable to you and making sure that you're doing your due diligence. Those things go a long way. That's why we're here to help. So any other scary stories that you'd like to leave our audience with today? Without violating client confidences, I will simply say one of the more entertaining situations that we have encountered over the years uh, was a gentleman who unfortunately decided to down an entire bottle of cough syrup during his lunch break at the behest of some coworkers who uh, were insistent that it was a great way uh, to become intoxicated. He returned to work and quickly realized that his stomach didn't agree with that plan of action wound up vomiting all up and down the hallways of his federal agency. Certainly not something that I would have wanted to be there for, but nonetheless, I think he learned his lesson and his coworkers probably did as well. I'm sure it was quite the scene uh, to, from, from, <laughs> from the, the, uh, the, the recounting that we were able to, to glean. And, uh, you know, I guess I would leave anybody listening with the advice of don't be that person. Uh, make sure that whatever it is that you're doing is going to pass muster with security officials. And when in doubt, the old advice of if what you're doing would shame your grandparents, uh, you probably shouldn't be doing it uh, is, I, I think, a good, a good one for anybody holding a security clearance. That's, that's really all the best we can do. Sure. So that really does sound like a scene from a horror film. But yes, follow the rules, consult legal advice when necessary, seek out resources that are credible when it comes to the security clearance process. So if you'd like to learn more, you can visit news.clearancejobs.com. Sean, thanks so much for joining me today. I do appreciate it. My pleasure. This is Katie Keller, editor at clearancejobs.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of Clearedcast. For more information on career and recruiting advice, visit news.clearancejobs.com.